Hello and welcome to my channel. If you're new, hi there, I'm Rachel Francois. Today's video is a video essay about my experience in Salem, Massachusetts on Halloween in 2020. And I'm also going to include the places that I went to, the tours I went on, the restaurants I ate at. So it's kind of a travel vlog as well. It was also a crazy experience traveling uh, right when the travel ban lifted and it worked out in some ways to our favor, in some ways not. So let's get into the story of Salem, Massachusetts, 2020. Well, it all started when I decided to make a trip up to North Florida to visit my bestie for his birthday. Um, everything had been closed for a while and everybody was working from home and there wasn't really anything to do. Overall, it was a lonely time. Having a full weekend sleepover sounded like a good idea at the time. And it was this weekend that he mentioned he wanted to go to Salem, Massachusetts for Halloween. And at that time I was all in. So it didn't take long until the hotel was booked, the flights were booked, the public transit was planned. A few days before, there were warnings of snow, and I always plan to travel with waterproof clothing or some sort of backup like that, um, but we were not prepared for what actually happened. So we landed in Massachusetts. We didn't get too turned around getting out of the airport and onto the train. Luckily we had all of our luggage with us which slowed us down so we didn't end up getting lost. It was raining and cold that day and getting a lot worse. To backtrack a little bit, the hotel was not easy to book. The goal was to stay inside historical Salem and not have to commute back and forth every day that we wanted to see any kind of historical tours. I booked in August and there were still only two options available. The room that we got or booking two separate rooms because the other rooms that were available either only had twin beds or full size beds. So this hotel that we booked ended up only being a little under $500 a night but split between two people it wasn't too bad for the area that we ended up staying in which was awesome. But this room was called the Micro King and it definitely lived up to its name. We just got to our hotel in Salem. Here's the bathroom. Wait, do the tour. Okay, so this is the room. <laughs> Wait, where? show us the bathroom. So the room starts there and then it ends here. <laughs> I can almost touch both sides. <laughs> and then, oh, but here's the bathroom. <laughs> Look. Here. We're gonna see each other <laughs> in the bathroom. Wait, that's it. this frosted glass. Wait. Yeah, you look like the grudge. <laughs> like a dark shadow in the mist. <laughs> oh, well, at least it's cute. It is cute, but it is a freaking hostel room. <laughs> So that was the size of the room. Then we started to notice other things like the toilet paper holder was like hanging on by a thread. The toilet tank itself was like leaking, like in the tank part, the little top was cracked. So every time we flushed the toilet, water would end up leaking out and onto the floor. I'm so glad it was the clean water tank that was leaking, but it was, it was damp. It was kind of damp in there. Then there was the very drafty window letting a steady frozen breeze into the room. And that's when we discovered our beautiful view. Hi, welcome to our hotel room at the Hotel Salem. <laughs> our beautiful view of the city. <laughs> it's, it's A lot of pigeons on this <laughs> roof over here. <laughs> into other buildings. So we finally got our stuff unpacked and uh, tried to figure out how to move around in this room with two people. It's definitely a room for like one person. 
We look really local. I look, you can't even see my face. <laughs> It was nice to go out without dragging around a bunch of bags. We went to the lobster shanty, which was the best thing we ate on the entire trip. We split a lobster roll, and if we had known how scarce the food was, we would have ordered some extra that first night that would have kept a little longer than leftover lobster. And on our way back to the hotel room from getting dinner, we passed by a group of people waiting for a haunted tour and we happened to be able to get some of the last tickets that were available for one of the tours later that night. We ended up going on one of the Haunted Footsteps tours, which was really awesome. The guides were very into the history and the guide we had was very thorough with the details. We absolutely loved it. The stops included the Hawthorne Hotel, Joshua Ward House, and ended at the Ropes Mansion and a lot of other areas that I can't remember and so many stories. So I highly recommend going on one of these historical tours, but I'm gonna highlight just a few of the cool stories that I remember from the tour that we went on. The city of Salem has been in existence since the 1600s, formed by a group of fishermen in 1626. The Salem Marine Society had occupied the building that sat at 18 Washington Square West, now known as the Hawthorne Hotel. The Hawthorne Hotel was originally known as the Franklin Building. It was designed and constructed by Samuel McIntyre with an original plan of being a multi-purpose building. The original building survived two fires before being completely destroyed in 1860 by a third fire. It was rebuilt in 1864. In the early 1920s, the city of Salem wanted to repurpose the building into a hotel to attract more tourists to the area. It was named after the famous Salem author, Nathaniel Hawthorne, who penned the famous Scarlet Letter. There have been a lot of ghost stories associated with the Hawthorne Hotel. The land that the Hawthorne Hotel was built on was once the site of Bridget Bishop's Apple Orchard. Bridget Bishop was the first to be hung on Salem's Gallows Hill in 1692 for the crime of witchcraft. She was later found to be innocent. It's reported that the most active rooms at this hotel are room 325 and room 612. Guests report phantom hands tugging on the sheets in the middle of the night, and even a few different occurrences when guests have claimed to have felt those phantom hands touching their hair and their hands as they slept. Those who stay in room 612 often report seeing a ghostly woman checking her reflection in the mirror. It's said that the ghosts of the High Sheriff George Corwin, Giles Corey, and others haunt the Joshua Ward house. This house is usually the first stop on a lot of the ghost tours. There is so much history on this one house that I could do an entire video on it. I'll highlight what I thought was the most interesting tidbit of history. Sheriff George Corwin came to power at the height of the witch trials in Salem. He was tasked early in his career with transporting five witches to the gallows one of those accused witches was Sarah Good. It was customary at the time to confess your crime or sins before being hung. A man by the name of Reverend Nicholas Noyce was tasked to coax the confessions of the accused and Sarah Good was not having any of this. Now, even though this isn't actually George Corwin's story, it is an interesting story that he was kind of associated with. While Sarah Good was being interrogated by Reverend Nicholas Noyes, with him trying to get her to confess, she said, you're a liar, I am no more a witch than you are a wizard, and if you take away my life, God will give you blood to drink. That man later died of a burst blood vessel in his chest and he bled into his lungs. So a lot of people, think that Sarah Good had something to do with it. On April 12, 1696, at just 30 years of age, the monster, George Corwin, slipped and fell in the snow while at home. Medical experts at the time suggest that he suffered a heart attack and many believe his spirit has not left the property. And there have been many accounts of people experiencing a choking sensation on the second floor due to the fact that George Corwin was known to take people that were suspected of being witches and strangling them as a way to get a confession out of them.
The Ropes Mansion, located at 318 Essex Street, is another building with a ton of history and deserves a video all on its own. It was built in the late 1720s by Samuel Bernard. In 1768, Judge Nathaniel Ropes purchased the house from the nephew of Samuel Bernard. Nathaniel Ropes was not a popular man in Salem since he still sympathized with the British crown, and in 1744, a mob attacked the mansion with mud and bricks, breaking the windows and damaging the property. But at the time, Judge Ropes was already sick with smallpox and died shortly after the attack at the age of 47. Over 60 years later, Judge Ropes' daughter, Abigail Ropes, also died in the house. It's alleged that she may have been carrying coals from one room to another when her petticoat caught fire and she burned alive in the house. Since then, other fires that have occurred in the house have been blamed on the ghost of Abby Ropes. At Ropes Mansion, the tour ends in the garden behind the house, and this is the most beautiful backyard I've ever seen. And the guide giving us our tour tells us that there's a bench in the garden which is known to be one of the most haunted spots in Salem, and people that often sit on the bench or take pictures near the bench capture um, apparitions or they see things in the pictures that they didn't see in real life. After taking photos, we were the only people left in the garden, and earlier during the tour, the tour guide told us that there is um, a trellis leading into the garden, which we had actually walked through, and dogs, if anyone goes on these tours and brings dogs, the dogs refuse to walk through the tunnel. So a lot of people think there is some sort of entity that lives in this trellis tunnel. And while he's telling us this, we're all kind of, because at the time we're standing in the center of this garden and we're looking back at the trellis. When I look back, I see a jack-o'-lantern glowing in the corner um, of the entrance, like when you first walk in. It was only until we were alone and about to leave, walking back through the trellis. And when I got to the end, there was no jack-o'-lantern. And I got freaked out and I said, run! And I'm like, there was a jack-o'-lantern ghost in the trellis. And I got made fun of pretty hard for that one. And it was so cold and because we were coastal and it was snowing, it was still very wet out. So we ended up wearing all of our clothes just in rotation. So it looked like we wore different outfits, but we were just wearing the same clothes over and over again. The next morning, I got a huge coffee from Redline Cafe, and it was this very cute, awesome cafe with amazing coffee and cute food and all kinds of stuff because it was still during shutdown times, kind of, but we could travel. We had to go get food or drink, and then we had to go back to where we were staying to consume it. And because of the holiday, the staff shortages, food shortages, everything going on, and the health risks, most of the restaurants were closed or there were very limited time windows that they were open. And at the same time, we booked tickets to the Salem Witch Museum because those tickets were hard to come by and we had to do it for the next day. While we were walking around earlier, we saw people waiting outside of shops and we were a little confused but we realized that they had limited people in the stores at a time. So it was really cool how they had everything planned out. You went up to a, a person with a little iPad and they put your name on a list like, um, like at a restaurant and then they would text you about five minutes before your turn to go into the store. So it took a little bit of planning, but we were able to pick out some stores we wanted to go into, put our names on the list, and the weather actually worked in our favor in this way because as the temperatures dropped, people opted to go inside and we were able to get into a lot of these shops uh, pretty quickly. And another benefit was that we got to go into these shops as people left. So, so you were only in there with six or eight other people, which was great because outside of this, the stores would be packed full, it would be chaos. Um, so we really got to look at everything that these stores had to offer. And the weather also helped us because we were able to get on another walking tour. We were destined to stick out the dropping temperatures. It did get very cold that day, um, but we wanted to see as much as we could. And this walking tour that we went on was more historical than haunted. And we ended up hearing a lot about the old Burying Point Cemetery and right next to it, the house that struck me the most even before we went on this tour was the Pickman House.
The house located on 43 Charter Street was built by Samuel Pickman in 1665. According to local legend, a family of three had moved into the home, a man, his wife, and his seven-year-old daughter. Shortly after settling in, the man's mental health began to deteriorate due to the current quarantine going on. Yes, they were having a quarantine as well at this time because of the yellow fever epidemic that was happening and everyone was ordered to stay inside. Now this man, he claimed he could see and hear demons in the home. And one day amid one of his episodes, he chained his daughter up in the attic. It was winter at this time and she had no food, no water and no warmth. His wife had been begging him to let their daughter out of the attic, but this only made him more angry. Eventually, the man got tired of his wife pleading and he gathered up some rope, tied her to a tree in the yard. Then he made his way to the kitchen where he started heating up a cauldron and throwing all the candles and wax into this cauldron that he could find. And then when it had all melted, he poured the wax over his wife's head who was tied to the tree outside. And then after she had died outside, he went inside and hung himself. Eventually, their daughter, who was still in the attic, also died. Visitors have captured what looks to be a young girl staring out the second floor window. Employees of the museum across the street claim to have heard disembodied voices at night, particularly voices that sound like children. Pictures have also captured bright orbs and human faces floating inside the house. This house is right next to the old Burying Point Cemetery. Old Burying Point, also known as Charter Street Cemetery, is the oldest cemetery in Salem and the second oldest in the nation. Burying Point is the final resting place for 347 people who called Salem home upon their death. The Old Burying Point Cemetery features a memorial to the victims of the Salem Witch Trials as well. This cemetery is a marker of history, a dark time in our country's past. These are the graves, the remains of people from a time that should never be forgotten. The hysteria surrounding the events cost many innocent people their lives and shined a light on the dangers of rumors and fallacies. An interesting story is that of Caleb Pickman. Caleb Pickman was 22 years old when he was killed by a lightning strike on July 4th, 1737. He has a small headstone and when he was buried, a small tree was near his burial site. Over time, the tree grew and appears to be growing out of the grave where he was buried. Over the years since then, the tree has been struck by lightning five times. There's not much known about Caleb, but people wonder why lightning seems to want to strike him even after death. At the end of this tour, we were starving and it had been a really long day. The frustration was mounting. Normal activities like walking around, eating, drinking were all a challenge during this time. And we did the best we could to cope with the obstacles, but the challenges were not over yet. We got back to the room and it is slightly over 80 degrees in our room. The heater wasn't on on, but hot air was like leaking through the vents. Like we could hear the unit wasn't on, but hot air was still coming through the vents. So the front desk person, um, all they could do was give us a fan. So he get, gets us this big square fan thing and we get it up to the room. We're like, what are we going to do? And then I'm like, oh my gosh, thank goodness that window is leaking cold air and it was got colder. So I put the fan right up against the window and turned it on so it blew cold air into the room. And that actually ended up balancing out the temperature pretty nicely. So we made it through the night without sweating, which was, I was like, if we don't get sleep after this day, it's going to be bad. So, but we slept, thank goodness. The only thing we had this day that was obligatory was the Witch Museum, and our tickets weren't until later that afternoon. We wanted to get away from the crowds, and we both wanted to visit this tattoo shop and art gallery that was close to Proctor's Ledge. It was about a mile away, so we decided to walk, and it was we walked through the cutest neighborhood.
We first went to Black Veil and spent way too much time there, just being mesmerized by all the beautiful art and installations they had in the gallery. We bought a lot of art that we were nervous about because we didn't know if they would fit in our carry-ons because both of us only um, brought carry-ons with us. It ended up being okay. The walk back to the city takes us right by Proctor's Ledge, which is alleged to be the location of the executions of the witch trials. And it's located behind a Walgreens and between a neighborhood, and no one really knows the exact location of where these executions took place, um, but it was determined by historians in 1921 that it's somewhere in that area. On our way back into the city, we see a line of people outside of a thrift store. And Jonathan mentions that he heard there was a thrift store that sells human bones, so we got in line to see if this was the one. We did a lot of looking around, and we did do some gawking at the remains, the little cabinet that they had of the bones, and I was wondering, I don't know, like, where these came from? I was thinking maybe they came from, like, the surrounding medical schools, but I had some. I still have some questions. Now at this point, we had to go back to the hotel, drop our goods, and get back to the Witch Museum for our tour. And I can't remember at this point if they don't allow phones inside the museum or if they cast a spell to erase any images that I took, but I swear I had more footage or pictures of inside of this place, um, but they're gone. Uh, but it was really entertaining, I really enjoyed the tour, and I learned a lot about the history of the Salem Witch Trials. And there's so much history to talk about, but I'm just going to highlight some of the things that still stick with me today. And I want to add that the research that I did um, did not match a lot of the details that they told us at the museum, so I'm going to reiterate what they told me at the museum. In 1692, Abigail and Betty, wealthy sisters, ages 11 and 9, their puritanical family had a house slave from Barbados named Tituba. Apparently, Tituba spent a lot of time with the girls and provided them with little games to keep them entertained. One day, she showed them a fortune teller, or what a lot of people call a cootie catcher. The girl's father found them playing with it and declared it witchcraft. Being young and impressionable and bored, the girls started to act out in ways that made the people of the town believe they were bewitched. In total, there were 10 girls that were afflicted, but many historians believe that this was all an act and an attempt to curb boredom. Tituba was the first accused. Betty and Abigail claimed that Tituba had been a witch and Tituba confirmed their accusations. Tituba confessed to being a witch, claiming she rode a broom and spoke to rats, and pledged her allegiance to Satan. At the time, confessing to being a witch would pardon you as long as you pointed out another witch. Tutuba, to what I learned, did not point out another witch. She was not hanged, but held in jail for about a year. Around 200 people were arrested and jailed for witchcraft, and where they were held was awful. People were literally put in a dungeon. The holding cells were a dark basement where the ground is covered in sewage, your cellmates are rats that nibble on your appendages, and the box you're in is no higher than four feet. I could talk about so much more, but this video would be way longer than it already is. And I'd love to do more research and explore more of the details in this history. Let me know if that's something you want to see. And that night was, in fact, Halloween. And we didn't have costumes, but we still got to enjoy the costume parade, which is everybody that gets dressed up just walking through the streets of historical Salem. Um, we ate some street food, and after all the walking and standing we had done that day, we wanted to retire early. So we had an early dinner at the hotel restaurant, and I'm not ashamed to say we were in bed by 9 p.m., and we didn't even get through the first half of Hocus Pocus. Exhausted is not the word for this morning. But we were so lucky to have the energy to get up and find breakfast at this cute little diner. But we were back to carrying all of our bags everywhere we went. And after breakfast, it was back on the bus, to the train, and into the city of Boston for the night. Now, after doing a lot of travel where I only use public transportation, I've learned that you want to stay as close to the airport if you have an early flight the next morning. So we got to stay at a more sophisticated hotel, but it was still next to a cemetery. 
The snow had stopped, but it was raining again, and our plans to see the North End and visit Cheers were thwarted. And we settled for a delicious Italian dinner with some wine. We had to get up super early the next day at like 5 a.m. or maybe earlier, and I had packed most of my stuff the night before, but somehow I end up leaving my phone in the bed. And I realized this while we're waiting on the train to take us to the airport. So I literally notice my phone's gone, grab the room, I'm, I still have the room key in my pocket, so I just take off. I ran the whole way back to the hotel, but it was, it was only maybe four blocks. It was plugged into the charger on the bed, like under the sheets, I find it, run back to the train. Thank goodness, like we only had to wait like three more minutes for the next train, but oh my gosh, like, so stressful like i was so planned and prepared this whole time until like the very last minute so we get back to the airport with no other issues and we both landed safely in our respective hometowns and we we're both relieved to get back to the routine that we knew so if you got to the end of this video, thank you so much for watching. I've been wanting to make this video for a while since my trip, but I haven't had time to really put it together. If you enjoyed this video, please consider giving it a like. And if you want more of content like this, that's historical travel vlog style videos, um, subscribe. And I plan on making more of these. The next trip I plan on making a video about is my trip to St. Augustine. So look forward to that one and I'll catch you next time.